Welcome to Library Seminars, NOAA Central Library's webinar series for the presentation of research and ideas that reflect the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's presentation, Equilibrium Reference Point Calculations for the Next Generation of Spatial Assessments, is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries. Today we'll hear from Maya Sosa Kapoor, who will be introduced by the organizer and host of this series, Kristen Blackheart from NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology in Seattle. But before I hand over the mic, here are just a few announcements from the library. Uh, the, rep the presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I will add the channel's link to the chat box during the presentation. Our speaker did share her slides, so please feel free to download them from the handouts menu in the webinar control panel You'll probably see a little orange arrow that can be pushed in and out. Uh, that's where you'll find it. And most important, we're very interested in your questions and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar, even though the speaker will not address them until the end of her presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or your comments in the chat box under questions located in the webinar control box. And with that, let's get started. The mic's yours, Kristen. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Maya, for being here with us today. Um, we're really excited to have Maya with us here. Maya received her bachelor's degree in environmental science from UC Berkeley, and then went on to get a master's degree in marine biology from the University of Hawaii. After her studies, she went on to work in the life history and stock assessment programs at the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center, um, and then went to the PhD program at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fisheries Science, where she's been studying with Andre Punt since 2018. Her work there emphasizes the importance of correctly specifying spatial processes in assessment models when performing management strategy, strategy evaluation with a focus on the Pacific fable fish stock. Um, this project that she's been working on is a collaboration between the Northwest and Alaska Fishery Science Centers and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, um, and is supported by a NIMS Sea Grant Population Dynamics Fellowship. And then in 2021, we were lucky enough as an agency to have Maya join the Status of Stocks and Multiple Multi-Species Assessments Program at the Alaska Fishery Science Center while she finalizes her PhD. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maya to tell us about her work. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks so much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak today. Um, so today I'm gonna be sharing with you a project that I led mainly with my uh, lab group at the University of Washington uh, but we also had some collaborators from NOAA work on this project as well. Um, so this project really originated uh, at a CAPM meeting that was held in New Zealand. This was uh, the workshop in next generation assessment models that was held in Wellington. This is the Wellington skyline I'm showing the background. Um, and this was a really cool meeting to attend, especially as a grad student, because basically it brought uh, stock assessment folks from all over the world together to put together sort of a wish list of what we would like the next um, 10 to 15 years of uh, stock assessment software to look like. And so if you're listening and you're um, you know, a grad student or an early career researcher or you collaborate with people in academia, I really encourage you to get involved with groups like CAPM because at least for me, it was a really nice way to kind of situate my research in the field at large. Um, but so one of the salient points that came out of this workshop was this desire to build a uh, flexible, modular, and as transparent as possible or open source framework uh, for stock assessment modeling. And so if you take a look at the uh, workshop report that came out of this meeting, right below that first bullet point that asks for a flexible modular framework, the next wish list item is the desire to readily uh, incorporate spatial structure into our assessment models. And so the fact that this was really such a high item on this wish list that's reflected in the report suggests two things to me. First of all, I think that a lot of people are uh, implementing spatial uh, structure into their stock assessments for good reason that we'll touch on in a little bit. 
And its emphasis on uh, being able to turn spatial structure on and off somewhat easily suggests that there are probably a lot of research track assessment models, or even just models run as sensitivities in the assessment report that look at, hey, if, are we ignoring something important by not accounting for spatial structure? Are there different spatial stratifications that might have impact on our management quantities? So this, to me, is good news because Obviously, I've spent a good chunk of my career so far thinking about spatial models, um, but it's also a, kind of a reminder that it's really important that we think carefully about having uh, transparent, peer-reviewed methods for translating information you know, from the raw data we get from the fisheries all the way through to management. And so I somewhat cheekily named this next slide the final frontier. I don't actually think that spatial structure is the final frontier in stock assessment, but the punt lab likes to have um, Star Trek references in our talks, so there you go. Um, I'd just like to take kind of a pause to remind folks that as we think about the next frontiers in assessment modeling, so climate change, you know, building an ecosystem-based fisheries management, the spatial domain is really the theater in which these environmental concerns are gonna play out. So almost any ecological question you might have about your population is inherently going to have an underlying spatial component. And the other, I guess, kind of opinion I have about this uh, is that I don't think spatial models necessarily need to be a first world problem. So I think over the last maybe 30 years, as we've improved our assessment platforms, we've made them more complicated, having more data, more processes, more parameters. And of course, a spatial model naturally is going to have some more parameterization built into it. But I suggest that you know, almost any fishery that has some level of spatial information, for example, in their survey, or even just geolocations in their fishery data, is capable of looking at demographic changes through space and how that might be impacting their assessment. So I think of spatial structure as really kind of a low-hanging fruit uh, in our efforts to understand how ocean change is going to impact fishery populations. And so this figure uh, on the left is from a book chapter from Steve Cadron and his colleagues. And what this is showing us is that as a fish cycles through its life, so time is on the x-axis, it's naturally going to occupy different components of that two-dimensional and really three-dimensional spatial domain. And so as that individual transitions from a recruit to a juvenile to adult, uh, it's naturally going to have differential availability to our data collection regime, vulnerability to the survey, and sensitivity to things like environmental forcing. This figure I'm showing on the right is from one of my own papers, and this is actually a more um, common manifestation of how some of these spatial questions can, can influence our data. Um, what we're looking at are residuals for a growth curve uh, for female sable fish in the Northeast Pacific. And what we see is something that's pretty common uh, actually for ectotherms worldwide, and that's that individuals get larger at cooler or more than northern uh, in our hemisphere latitudes. And so you could tell yourself that this isn't a big deal if you're doing your stock assessment at a small enough spatial domain such that this variation in growth maybe doesn't matter. Um, you could also tell yourself you don't really expect ocean temperatures to change very much in your region. Um, but when we think about species like sablefish that can move incredibly long distances, and this notion that under climate change, cold regions in particular are going to be warming faster, it's almost like we've introduced this big CV on growth um, that a spatial model could perhaps reconcile. And so I share these slides to remind us that these really fundamental processes we think about uh, in stock assessment, so spawning, recruitment, growth, um, can readily have a spatial component. And I think this has been really well appreciated, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, um, particularly as we've had the computational power to really test, okay, if I'm ignoring this, you know, what's it gonna do to my stock assessment model? And so there's been lots of great work on that latter point. Um, here I'm showing data from a paper by Lisa Kerr's group out in the Northeast. Um, this paper is about 10 years old now, uh, but I really like it because it very, neatly summarizes some of the trade-offs that can occur when we ignore spatial structure in our assessment models. And so what their group did 
is they fit uh, what they call the management model, which basically mimics the political boundaries of the stock, that's these gray lines. And then they also fit a biological model that has some, um, excuse me, spatial structure in the demography of Atlantic cod. And what you'll see is that that spatial model, which is these black lines, is much more sensitive to the fishery exploitation and universally uh, had a lower stock spawning biomass at various degrees of exploitation. In addition, it also had a more conservative, that is a higher estimate of the CV in that derived quantity. And the figure on the right is probably what concerned people the most, because this is what indicated that if we are ignoring spatial structure, we're going with this gray management model, we're basically misplacing our FMSY and overestimating the total yield that's gonna be obtainable by our stock. And so there's been lots of uh, great work in this area up to and including you know, management strategy evaluation quite work, type of work. Um, and so I think people uh, are pretty hip to this idea that, hey, it's worth looking at spatial structure um, if you're building an assessment model. What has not changed, at least systematically, is how we translate from these spatially structured assessment models through equilibrium quantities to the values that managers need to do things like set catch limits. So to do this, regardless if you're in a spatial model or not, we need this uh, equilibrium notion of biomass and recruitment that we put together to form our reference point. And so my claim with this study is that these equilibria must be treated differently under certain spatial paradigms, specifically when density dependence in recruitment is localized. And based on the kind of background research our group did for this study, uh, most widely used assessment platforms are not implementing this. And so what I'm gonna do in the next section is walk through kind of what this problem looks like mathematically, uh, and also with some illustrations, and then explain a simulation study we did to kind of to develop and test uh, a potential algorithm to uh, approach this issue. So if we start with a familiar math for deriving quantities that lead us to a reference point, um, here I'm showing three process equations for a two area age structured model in which you can have, uh, well, you can have more than two areas in the simulation there are two. Uh, you can have the areas linked by movement. And the important thing to note here is this last equation, uh, the stock recruitment curve, is a function of the total biomass in the system. And so that means is that every time step, uh, the reproductive output or the number of recruits is a function of the aggregate biomass across all the different areas. And so even if 99% of your biomass is in one area, you're still gonna get the same output as if 50% were in each. And so the happy thing about this setup is that our equilibria are linearly related to recruitment. And so that means we can neatly write down an analytical function that takes F and you know, our life history parameters, what have you, and solves for our maximum sustainable yield. And so if you are doing a, a spatially structured assessment model in stock synthesis, for example, this is what you're doing. You're parameterizing a stock recruitment curve that applies to the entire population, uh, and it's optimizing over that space. So what happens when this relationship is violated? Here I'm showing those same process equations, also for a spatially structured population, but the key difference here is in this final equation where the density dependence is instead localized. So instead of having our beverage and Holt be a function of the global biomass across the whole domain, we're instead interested in the uh, output of each individual area being a function of the biomass of that area. And so what this requires is that we need to track the area-specific yield that results from an individual recruit spawned in each area. I'll show some figures to explain what I mean by that. But the key thing to really notice here is that we have this introduced this nonlinearity where the recruitment in one area is itself dependent on both the biomass in its own area and the subsidy it's receiving elsewhere. And so in practice, we no longer can write down a neat little analytical solution and hand it to our optimizer uh, to identify our reference point. So let's walk through that same information graphically. I think it's always useful to kind of see things visually too. So in this illustration, we're going back to the, the ninth situation. 
Uh, what I have in this example are two populations. You can think of them as two states. One is California, one is New York. And I've set it up so that 10% of the Californians move to New York every year, and 30% of the New Yorkers move to California every year. And what you see at each time step on the far right, the red points are plotting the population size in each of those states. And after only about four or five uh, time steps, this model really quickly approaches that gray line, which is the eigenvector. And so this represents the relative population size in each state at which the net exchange is stable. And so you can imagine that if we introduce that global density dependent effect and sprinkled a fixed proportion of individuals each year, we'd still easily be able to snap back to that equilibria. So what happens now is we can look at what, what happens when that assumption is violated. If you start with your two populations, the um, New York and California, and simply intermix them and stop here in the middle of the screen, you basically have the simple simulation I showed previously. However, if you introduce localized density to dependence, suddenly you have this complicated situation where the population in California is based both on the population coming in from New York and the recruitment generated based on the population in California. However, that biomass that's coming in from New York is itself dependent on its own biomass and the subsidy coming in from California. So if that sounded confusing, it's because it is, because we've introduced this circularity in the system and it means we can't write down a neat solution and converge towards that eigenvector. And so I think it's useful uh, to pause and, and look at what uh, the current or more commonly used stock assessment platforms have sort of done to approach this issue. And so this table is not necessarily an exhaustive list, um, but it's uh, many of the really widely used, well-tested assessment softwares that people use the world over. And what we're seeing is that basically all of them have pretty sophisticated ways of accounting for spatial structure in the model. This kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning that, you know, people have known even since well before any of us entered the field that spatial structure can impact our management outcomes. Um, and with increased computational power, we thought, okay, we might as well build in the capacity in our software to really test this. What's missing or, or maybe what's not as strongly represented in these platforms uh, is that the way of calculating equilibria based on those models generally relies on averaging or aggregating across the system. So earlier I mentioned stock synthesis that uses a global recruitment function. Um, the one I do want to highlight that I think most closely approximates what we would be interested in is called VPA2 box. This is written by Clay Porch uh, out in the Southeast. Um, and this model is cool because like I mentioned earlier, uh, it does track the natal area of individual fish to kind of get at um, what's happening at the per stock basis per recruit. Um, the one kind of nuance here is that this setup uh, does, forces the fish to remember their natal area. What that means is that if you had a sable fish, for example, that moved from California to Alaska, it would behave in Alaska as if it were still in California in terms of movement and demography. So uh, it's not able to assimilate into its new region. And so the solution we proposed uh, for this uh, problem is to basically rearrange that bottom equation of the localized stock recruitment function to show that we're able to numerically solve for the vector of recruitment. And so instead of doing your typical equilibrium recruitment calculations where you would you know, solve for alpha and beta on a global basis, we instead run an optimizer that returns the proportion recruitment which will equilibrate the localized beverage and whole output. And so to kind of illustrate and test how this is working, uh, we set up a simple simulation model uh, just written in R, nothing fancy, um, that requires a, a set of life history parameters, putative proportion of recruitment to each area, um, and some movement rates between them. Um, and so in the next little bit, I'm going to illustrate kind of what the baseline output of that model looks like and then talk about the key uh, results. So earlier I mentioned that this approach as well as the Pro2Box approach uh, relies upon tracking the fate of individual recruits spawned in each area. 
So what I'm showing in this figure on the x-axis is age and the y-axis is the proportion survival. Uh, and in this circumstance, what we have is a recruit spawned in area two will decay or die subject to natural mortality. But if I have some movement, in this case, the source sink dynamic, uh, a proportion of that recruit is gonna move to area one. So that's the, the black line. Same thing in area one, if it's operating as a, a, a sink area, um, all fish, all recruits that are spawned there simply dec decay due to natural mortality and you have no individuals moving to area two. And so once we get this together, we can also calculate the total numbers in area, which is just adding up uh, the recruits in each. And so the way that the workflow of that equation I showed earlier happens is we find the spawning biomass per recruit in each area without fishing and also given an F vector. So basically creating those graphs I just showed at various levels of F. And then we pass that array to an optimizer who, that solves for the recruitment vector that equilibrates recruitment across the system. And that can then be used to calculate equilibrium catch at our given F vectors. And then we can search for MSY. And so when we run these simulations, we need to look at some straightforward performance metrics to help us characterize how this proposed localized approach is behaving and of course compare it to the global method because the key question here is all right let's say i feel confident that i'm correctly correctly specifying the spatial structure of my model how big a deal is it if i'm not invoking this new algorithm uh, to calculate uh, my management quantities and so one of the ways we do this is by testing many combinations of f one for each area and populating this two-dimensional yield surface. So if you've seen uh, a lot of the literature, spatial uh, management literature, you'll often see these kind of heat map type plots uh, where folks are interested in, in comparing what happens uh, when you fish different each area at a different level. And so from there, we can extract the FMSY and the associated reference points based on both the global recruitment assumption, which is our status quo, and this new proposed iterative solution, which I call the local recruitment assumption. And so if you are in the punt lab or have interacted with Andre, you know that you don't really get to jump into the complicated fun simulation modeling first. You always have to build a simulation where you know what the answer should look like uh, as a sanity check. So for this first uh, check, we ran some simulations where the two areas were not linked. So it's basically just two populations growing, being exploited at their own rate, but no movement between them. And what we found that as you might expect, even though the underlying shape of the yield surface deferred between areas, the reference points were the same. So here on the left side, uh, I recognize that text is a little small, but this is the global approach, so basically the status quo. The right-hand side is this new localized algorithm. And these splotches in the corner are basically areas where the discrete model wasn't really well able to converge or wasn't able to estimate uh, easily. We see this in a lot of scenarios, uh, but it's never in the range of the optima. And so this uh, fact of these two approaches being identical was the same in the case of no movement, regardless of where I put the putative recruitment fraction. So anywhere from 0.5, I think this is showing 0.7, all the way up to 0.9, um, we don't have distinctions between the approaches when there's no movement. So that's a good thing, obviously. Um, this was also true when we had the two areas linked via symmetrical movement. So if the same amount of individuals just moved back and forth every year, uh, there wasn't a difference between the reference points. And so for this talk, uh, what I'd like to do is highlight the standout cases uh, that came about when we ran this simulation under all kinds of different scenarios. So we varied steepness, we looked at different degrees of exchange, um, we also were interested in the extremity of source sink dynamics, uh, as well as varied natural mortality and selectivity. And so I'm just gonna highlight three cases where we saw the greatest discrepancies between approaches. This first case is the presence of very strong source sink dynamics. So in this case, I have 40% of individuals moving from one area to the other. And uh, what we see here is that both approaches are suggesting, hey, you should probably not ex 
exploit this source area. Uh, the global approach proposes a much lower F and leaves uh, a good chunk of the MSY on the table. Uh, similarly, differential selectivity between the two regions also led to discrepancies between the approaches. So generally, and this is true for this approach uh, as well as many of the others we just tested, uh, we see that the local assumption is very responsive to area-specific exploitation and the vulnerability of those individual areas. Uh, at the same time, the local assumption is also more uh, conservative of those areas that are vulnerable. And so here, um, what we see again is that um, there's kind of a yield premium that's gained by using the uh, localized model in that MSY is higher. Uh, the last one I wanted to highlight uh, was, was a situation where we purposely made uh, one of the areas very vulnerable. So set H very low, set M very high. Uh, and again, this was causing very strong discrepancies between the approaches. And so in all the simulations we tested, uh, the global MSY was either equivalent to or lower than the localized assumption. So this could suggest that if you suspect your stock might have these uh, recruitment dynamics happening, uh, there's potential management implications worth investigating. And so a last kind of interesting thing that came out of this uh, analysis was as we were examining the output, uh, Andre noticed that it seemed like there was a general threshold for how much extra yield uh, the sink area could tolerate such that it's possible to substitute movement for increasing exploitation. And so we did this final little experiment by allowing movement to mimic selectivity. Uh, here, this parameter Q is representing the proportion of individuals moving from one area to the other, again, in a source sync setup. And what we saw is that uh, under that local assumption, so our new proposed algorithm, uh, the total FMSY was essentially conserved, it, and that applied to a range of Q values from about 10% to 90%. Additionally, the FMSY in this new approach, the localized assumption, was typically about twice the global estimate. Uh, and this is kind of a rule of thumb that uh, Andre had proposed as, as potentially representing some behaviors in these systems uh, that might prove useful as we continue developing these reference points. And so what have we learned from this analysis? Uh, first of all, I, I hope we demonstrated that there is a tractable numerical solution to this ostensibly complicated problem. Um, in each scenario that I ran, uh, it took no more than about 30 seconds to find the minima on my laptop computer. So um, I think in terms of computational time, this wasn't too bad. Um, we also saw that the more vulnerability we introduced you know, whether by varying, reducing the age at 50% selectivity, um, the greater these discrepancies arose between approaches. And so it seems that the local assumption was more responsive to the fine-grained dynamics happening in the system and typically resulted in a yield premium or higher MSY. And that's been shown in some other studies as well. Um, the Final thing on this takeaway is that um, I think it is worth exploring or considering if your stock has these dynamics at play. And I mean, this isn't necessarily a niche or edge case situation that we developed just so we could do the simulation study. Uh, it's very conceivable that a species that, for example, has an established nursing ground or one that travels long distances to spawn uh, is going to exhibit a more localized recruitment behavior um, that could be better fit by this approach. And so certainly if anyone online is involved with the actual next generation stock assessment model project, FIMS, uh, I would love to talk to you more. Uh, Rick Mathot is a colleague on this paper, um, obviously, so we've talked about potential applications for stock synthesis, but considering this is where a lot of effort is going for the next um, you know, decade or more of assessment modeling, it would be great to talk about uh, how these uh, potential management quantities could be developed. Um, and the final thing I just wanted to share is that I see the next phase of my research uh, really looking at this possibility that equilibrium quantities might become untenable, especially as our models become increasingly complicated representations of space-time. 
Um, so something I'm interested in exploring is if perhaps more simple proxies for spawning biomass uh, can be used for stock status determination. Um, so thank you so much for your time and attention. I encourage you to check out the paper uh, in fisheries research that's associated with the next gen workshop. Uh, you're also welcome to email me um, if you have any questions that you're not ready to articulate yet. Um, and I invite you to check out the GitHub repo, which has all the code for developing the simulation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maya, for your presentation. Um, we have lots of time to answer audience questions right now, and we'd love to hear them. So if you have a question or a comment, please type them in the questions chat box located in the control panel, and I will read them to Maya. Um, and while we wait for those questions to come in, I also want to rem uh, remind people that Maya shared her slides, so please feel free to download them uh, from the handouts menu in the control panel as well. And one last uh, reminder, uh, we have been recording today's presentation, and I plan to upload it to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel in the next couple of hours. So if you know of anyone that couldn't make it today who might uh, want to hear this presentation, please share that with them. So I'm waiting for questions to come in. Um, it takes a second. Here's the first one. Uh, the first question asks, any thoughts on how the rule of thumb applies to systems modeled with more than two areas? Got to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I can't speak uh, really based on um, uh, experiments, um, but what I would emphasize is that that little analysis we did towards the end there was focused on a source sync dynamic. So, uh, when we set it up, our goal was that the uh, patterns in movement mimicked selectivity and also followed a source sync. So it's plausible that you could design, for example, a three area simulation where that was true, where you'd have two areas that converged upon or you know donated to a, a third sync area. Um, it, I would be curious to know if that if it resulted in two times the biomass or maybe a different scalar. Um, but yeah, I just want to emphasize that the important things for that rule of thumb is that movement is basically standing in for selectivity um, and it's a source thing. Thanks. Thank you. Um, please forgive me for, I might chop up this next question. <laughs> um, have you figured out how to use localized recruitment dynamics with SPR, MSY proxies like F35 percentage? Yeah, I think this person is is maybe uh, kind of getting at this. The very last thing I said was like, are there simpler ways to do this? Slash, can this apply to the non NOAA main NOAA paradigm? The short answer is no. I haven't figured it out or looked at it. I think that being able to generate whatever the system's notion of equilibrium recruitment, what have you, is an important first step. And the other thing is that, especially if you look in the, the code, I think might be easier to illustrate, uh, that tracking, that array we generate that tracks the fate of the recruits within each area, uh, I think could be the precursor to being able to test it against different proxies. Um, my maybe optimistic belief is that once you have that tracking in place and then can do your optimizer, you should be able to change um, the scale that you're interested in. I hope that helps. Please email me if you'd like to discuss that more. That sounds interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm waiting for more questions, and so we'll give it a second. And just as a reminder, um, Maya has a, has a citation there uh, for fisheries research, and of course we at the library have access to that. So if you have any <laughs> problems accessing her, her, her that, that article, please contact the library at library.reference at noaa.gov. Sponsored by the library. Sponsored by the library, absolutely. Um, just going to wait another second to see if we get any more questions. Ah, here we go. So this one's asked, comment not question. Ten of us on the FIMS implementation team are here. Andrea Havron, Chris Legault, Christine Stowitz, Howard Townsend, Ian Taylor, Catherine Doring, Meg Oshima, Patrick Lynch, Rick uh, Metho, and Tim Miller. But I think we're a long way from thinking about these spatial issues yet. So your research, excuse me, um, is timely. And that's the comment. 
Oh, great. So nice to, to hear from you guys, and I'm really appreciative that you joined in my talk. Um, yeah, I totally recognize that the STEMS project is still in its infancy, and this maybe isn't like the highest priority on your list. Um, but I think it's uh, valuable that we think about, okay, you know, what is the spectrum of uncertainty that people are regularly going to start to want to test in their models? And in my, you know, early career experience, the more and more um, kind of easy to use the software has become, that range of uncertainty has expanded. I'm sure you're familiar with this more than I am. And so once you guys build in, you know, the flexible, dynamic, spatial structure that folks are going to, you know, mine basically for their MSEs and what have you, I think it's going to be very valuable that we have a clear way to quantify, well, what is this actually playing out in terms of our uh, management uncertainty if we're accounting for the equilibria correctly. Um, so that's just, you know, I guess I'm preaching to the choir, but um, I think it's important as we build up, you know, e each thing we build in that we let people do, let's make sure we're actually carrying it through to the derived quant uh, and the management quantities appropriately. Thanks. This is another um, question. Excellent talk. Thank you. Was recruitment always local, or did you investigate cases where recruitment spawned from an area could be distributed across a number of areas? Yeah, that's a good question. So I apologize if I didn't make this clear enough in the talk. So the, what, the way we kind of uh, investigated this approach was imagining that there is uh, a degree of recruitment that is proportionally being assigned to each area. And so this was actually more of a mathematical trick than trying to represent anything ecological. But basically we say, imagine this one singular global recruit has a certain proportion being allocated to each area. Could be two, could be three, could be any number of areas. Um, what happens is that that enables us to do the global calculation, which basically treats that putative R vector, meaning the proportion to each area, as the truth and can quickly converge on the solution. In the local assumption, what happens is that's just a putative assumption. And if you pass that through the beverage and Holt, for example, you're not going to get the same answer back on the first go of it. And so that's where that this new algorithm comes in and is like, all right, what does that actual localized proportion have to look like uh, in order us, for us to recover uh, the equilibrium quantity? I hope that, that answered your question. I think it must have. I, 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 so I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I think that might be the end of our Q&A. Um, so I thank you so much, Maya, for, for presenting today. And of course, to Kristen Blackheart, who organizes the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series. Um, I hope you'll all join us again uh, next month for uh, another National Assess Stock Assessment Science webinar. Um, it, normally, it's, it's hosted the first Thursday of the month at 3 o'clock Eastern time. However, we'll be hosting a speaker located in China next month. So we have adjusted the time of the next webinar to noon Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all. I hope that you, uh, you get some good questions, Maya, by email. And uh, everybody, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Take care. Take care.